everybody's doing good tonight. Good to see everybody out. Everybody had a good day? Good. Praise the Lord. Um, food bank tomorrow. Um, ask our volunteers to be here at 9. It looks like there might be a chance of rain. I don't think it's going to. Um, so we got ponchos and trash bags. But regardless of what happens, it'll be a good day in the Lord. Amen. And so we need all the help we can get. And uh, so we'd love to have you out. Um, via way of prayer request, uh, Brother Jim Smith um, had his surgery this morning. Um, he did well through it. He's in the Marion Hospital, room 340. So we want to remember him as he recovers. He had back surgery. Terry Linton had his hip replacement on Monday. Saw him yesterday, and he was starting to move around. So remember Brother Terry in our prayers, um, and Miss Linda as well. Um, one of, Dennis Kirk was able to come home on um, one day. What, what day did he come home? Monday. Monday. Anyway, he came home. He's doing. He, he's. He, I thought he was doing really well. So we want to continue to remember him in our prayers. Do you remember Sue Miracle? Um, the Tom Malone family, some of you who've been here a long time will remember when I first came, we had a revival with Dr. Tom Malone. His wife uh, passed away. He was the president of the Bible college I went to. Um, so remember his family. Remember Jackie Oxford. What other requests do we have tonight? Mr. DeLay. Technically. <laughs> From an English standpoint, it's delay. Okay, I, I never get that right. Okay, uh, delay. Delay AI. Alicia is doing better. Praise the Lord for that. Jeff. Scott Embry. I'm glad you said, Brother Scott. Definitely needs a touch from the Lord. Yeah, she uh, uh, got to come home, everything checked out, so, yeah. Les? Les's family. Um, Martha? Health issues? Remember Teresa and remember Jane. Teresa is one of our food bank helpers. That's going to injure us. She carries a big load over there. You all got to pick up your weight tomorrow. Okay. All right. Lois. Barbara Colsey. Okay. What's his name? Remember Cooper? Brad? Okay, absolutely. Remember Sister Lisa? Amy? Remember Rosemary? Bruce? Hey, praise the Lord, man. Power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The church was what? Excited. Excited. Amen. I bet. Amen. I haven't had that in a long time. I always have glitches. You're ahead of me, bud. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Brittany Wright. Greg, we've got to find my other chair. Did I sit so low in that one? I feel like a little kid. Melina? Praise the Lord for River. Yeah, River. Oh, man. Lois? Remember Bonnie Gilbert. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and um, ask His blessings over these folks. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that we can come together tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your rich blessings upon our lives and upon our church. And God, tonight, we lift up these requests to you, Lord. We thank you, God, for being God in good moments and God in bad moments, God God in the valley and God on the mountaintop. God, I thank you for the praise reports that we heard tonight, and we just continue to praise you for those and thank you for those. Thank you for hearing and answering prayers. God, tonight we pray for those who are recovering from surgeries. We pray, dear Lord, that you touch their bodies as they recover. We pray for those who are battling illness. We pray, dear God, a special touch of healing upon their bodies. I pray for those who are battling lost. Um, um, the Lord, who have lost and unsaved people in their life. And, and Lord, who may be lost and unsaved. We pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just touch them. Pray for those who are grieving tonight. Um, and Lord, we pray, dear God, Lord, that... Um, you would be with us here tonight as we gather in this room to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for um, this time that we have together. We pray for our food bank tomorrow. God, if it be your will, and if you, um, Lord, if, um, if you would, please, God, remove that rain or let it come early or late or give us some dry spells in the parking lot. If not, we'll just keep going, Lord. We thank you, God, for all that you blessed us with. We just love you and praise you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. All right. Glasses like an hour and a half ago, and it's a new prescription, and I'm trying to get used to it. You guys know what I'm talking about? They did not give me bifocals because I told them I didn't want them, but I'm having a little issue. Just everything seems different. You know what I'm saying? And so it's the first time you stood and you kind of looked at everybody, and so if I pass out or something, you guys know what? You guys know what the issue was? Okay. I said, Steffi, like me the glasses. She's like, they look exactly the same. I was like, well, they're not. She's like, well, what's the difference? I was like, these don't have green ends. <laughs> so, all right. I don't even recall. I think it was a tie last week. <laughs> like, no, we won. All right, so we're going to give you guys an opening question tonight. There's more of you on this side, so you have a little bit of advantage. Um, however, I see Delton has started joining us now, and he got... A 4.0 at Agape in Bible class. So they brought in a ringer. In what book of the Bible is an iron axe head recorded as floating? Isaiah is incorrect. Second Kings. Right before they give the account of Naaman. Who was the first king of Israel? Saul. Saul's correct. One to nothing. Which book in the Bible contains the following prophecy of the crucifixion? They part my garments among them and they cast lots upon my vesture. What did you say, Roland? 
Isaiah, he says Isaiah. You guys good with Isaiah? Roland said Isaiah. <coughs> Which book of the Bible contains the following prophecy of the crucifixion? They part my garments among them and they cast lots upon my vestures. Psalms, Psalms is correct. One, one to one, Psalms 22. What Old Testament figure is specified in the Gospel of Luke as being an ancestor of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist? What Old Testament figure is specified in the Gospel of Luke as being an ancestor of Elizabeth? Who is the mother of John the Baptist? This parentheses on the mother of John the Baptist. Didn't know that one. That's a, that's a great question. Who, what Old Testament figure specified in the Gospel of Luke as being an ancestor of, of Elizabeth, who is John the Baptist's mother? Delton, here's your opportunity to blow their minds. Dave? Gonna need an answer. Caleb, gonna need an answer. Nobody else responding. You don't. Go ahead. He felt like I was asking him a question. I said, Caleb? Caleb. Caleb. No, it's not. It's Aaron. <laughs> but it'd been funny if it was your namesake, you know? <laughs> All right. One to one still. Yeah, one to one. How many generations were there from Adam to Noah? Start counting. Fourteen is incorrect. Nine. Nine. Which, for which New Testament book is there least evidence of its exact authorship? For which New Testament book is there the least evidence of its exact authorship? Hebrews is correct, son. Very good. Thank you. Two... To one. Which epistle of Paul contains his analogy of the armor of God? Ephesians. Ephesians. Very good, Tim. Just jumped out on there. Two to two. After what incident did God give man permission to eat meat? Cornelius, is that what you're saying? Acts 10? Yeah, that's incorrect. The flood. They were eating meat. They were eating meat long before that. But you're thinking, of, it's a good, you're, I know exactly what you're thinking of. Because when I first saw it, that was what came to my mind. But I, I should have reread the question for you. On what mountain did Moses receive the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Mount Sinai is correct. Three to two. Did I ask that question last week? Y'all don't remember who won last week. You can go tell me. 
Which book contains the following prophecy of Jesus' trial? He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. What? Isaiah 53, that's right. Very good, Olivia. Name Abraham's best known concubine. <laughs> well, more than one. Name Abraham's best known concubine. Ishmael's mother, I'm going to need her name. Hagar, that's it. Four to three. Richie, it was you? Oh, where? <laughs> According to Genesis, how long did it take God to create everything? Yep. Six days. Four to four. So we have two questions left. What part of Peter's mother-in-law did Jesus touch to have the fever leave her? What part of Peter's mother-in-law did Jesus touch to have the fever leave her? I got the fever. Forehead, is that what you guys want to go with? You good with your team? Hand? Hand, hand or forehead? Which one? <laughs> hand is correct. All right, for the tie, what is the unpardonable sin? Blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. Very good. Tie game tonight, 5-5. Five, five. Congratulations. I love a good tie. <laughs> so we are going to continue discussing personal evangelism tonight. Um, we're getting further and further along. Um, here in just a few weeks, we'll be actually trying to do practical ways and maybe kind of stand you up and get you with a group and maybe do some examples on how to, how to share our faith. Amen? Our curse, cold hearts, tearless eyes, closed lips, heavy feet, and fruitless lives in a world of sin and sinners. Um, what breaks your heart? What? Sadness? Don't like to see people sad, do you? No? Break your heart when people die? Sure. Disappointment. Mm -hmm. I hate when children are, 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 are taken advantage of or beaten or abused. or That breaks my heart. Huh? Amen. That's Amen. Cruelty. Cruelty. Yeah. Lies. Lies. Abortion. Abortion. Here in the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. Cancer. What? Cancer. You see that every day. Work at the cancer clinic? Absolutely. Yeah. Huh? Cheating. Nobody likes cheating, do they? Uh -uh. What else? The way people live. The way people live. Yeah. Amen. Um, we could go on and on about things that break our heart. Amen. Um, however, and I'm, I don't want to discount, there are a lot of things that break my heart um, that um, in a whole um, don't really amount to a hill of beans. I mean, we all have emotions, right? All of us, um, there's some things that are kind of non-eternal or non-biblical that break our heart. I mean, the Cowboys break my heart every year. Um, Caleb, the Cardinals since 2011 have broken your heart 
Every year and every off season, every day, Caleb says, today's the day they make the big trade. Never happens. Um, maybe you have an expectation of somebody or somebody lets you down and kind of breaks your heart. Um, maybe you're expecting a gift or a surprise and breaks your heart. Um, there's a lot of things that miss with our emotions where we go from here to here. However, when we start to see... Um, Lives be hurt, like physically hurt, mentally hurt, spiritually hurt. It takes us to a whole new level. However, in our society, the word death has become almost cohesive in our daily language. We hear people dying all the time. We hear of wars going on. Um, somebody mentioned lying and cheating and stealing. Uh, Larry Dodd, I liked what you said, the way people live. Um, and you get to the point where you almost become calloused over the things that you hear, whether it be headlines, with the invention of technology, there's no sight that's unseen anymore. Um, used to what we would consider to be horrible violence is raging in, our, in front of our eyes daily. Um, no longer, and, and the more we see things, and the more we absorb things, and the more we hear things, the more calloused or desensitized we become to them. Um, what used to really bother you, say, um, and we've used the example plenty of times, used to, you know, killing on TV. Um, that would be a horrible sight to see, and very rarely would they put that, or sex on TV. And now these things are just common in our, in our, 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 our mainline shows. Um, we've used it with words, um, such as um, the Lord's name in vain, or different curse words. Used to, you would never hear them mentioned, and all of a sudden now they're a part of a daily vocabulary that you constantly hear. Um, and over time, I'm not saying that we are, but a lot of people become very desensitized to it. Um, and if we think as Christians that we can't become desensitized to that, we're wrong in thinking that. Um, but at the same time, um, we need to even go a further level. Um, everybody who we come in contact is a creation of God. Amen? So, your biggest enemy is a creation of God. Amen? The person who makes you the maddest, God created them. Not only did God create them, but God cares about their soul. And there's a great extrinsic value in human life and the human soul. And by and large, with the way that um, life has become almost malle malleable in our day and time, it, we, we've cheapened the value of life. Um, we've cheapened the value of life with things like abortion. We've cheapened the value of life with the discussions of euthanasia. We've cheapened the value of life with the wars that we've had. We've cheapened the value of life, um, period. Um, and, and we think to ourselves, man, um, but God knows every single soul. Every one of them is imprinted on the palm of his hand. He has deep, vast care. He didn't come to just die for the people who attend White Ash Church. He came and died for everybody. Um, he died for the ones who don't share the same political views that you may. He died for the ones that um, would curse your name. He died for the ones who are advocating on a daily basis that it's okay to kill children in the womb. He died for people standing at a border trying to get into a free country. He died for people in Africa. He died for people in Europe. He died for people in Ukraine. He died for people in Russia. There's nobody on the face of the earth that Christ didn't die for. And so therefore, the greatest harvest, the greatest thing that when we think about a broken heart is that the moment that we leave this earth, there's not a second chance. There's not a do-over. Um, regardless of what Catholics may think, there's not a purgatory. You're not going to pray somebody in somewhere or out of somewhere. When you leave this earth, it's final. It's complete. And so the question that stands, and if we believe the Bible, which I know that we do, we believe that there's only one way to get into heaven, and that way is through Jesus Christ. And so when you hear of somebody dying, the heartbreaking thing you have to ask yourself is, is, did they know the Lord or did they not know the Lord? Now, we grieve a lot for people we lose. Amen. I'm with you. It's hard to lose somebody. But as a Christian, to know that they're living still should bring great joy. Amen? Now, you guys know as well as I do, there's nothing more hopeless, I mean hopeless, than standing at a funeral or being at a funeral of somebody who renounced God and, and, and didn't love the Lord and, and, and openly declared it. And you ask yourself, man, what do you even say? What do you, there's no words. 
It's this heartbreaking feeling that you just, you don't have the answer. And that's why we shouldn't wait till afterwards, but wish you look now. And everybody that you see with your own eyes, you have to ask the question, does God love them? And the answer is inevitably what? Yes. Did God die for them? Yes. Do they need to make a decision about Jesus? Yes. Are they promised tomorrow? No. Do you have an opportunity to share your faith with them? Yes. Um, throughout my time talking to preachers and different people, they've shared times where they know known they should have said something. They've known they should have went and seen somebody. They've known they should have talked to somebody, and they didn't do it. Um, I'm on the Agape board, and one of the spiritual overseers is a guy by the name of Ron Knox. Um, he was a pastor at First Baptist of Royalton for quite some time, and... Um, I love, I love old preachers because they, they forgot more than I'll probably ever know. Um, and he pastored in Royalton for years and did a great work up there. And he said there was this guy, um, everybody in town I think called him Jethro. Um, and Jethro was bad to drink and he said he would drive by him all the time. And he said he, he knew him and he knew of him. And it was one night he said it was kind of cold. He'd seen Jethro. Jethro was sitting on the, on the, on the park bench in Royalton. I don't know exactly where that is, but he drove by and he seen him and he said, man, I, I, he said, the spirit of the Lord was telling me, go talk to this guy. This guy needs you to talk to him tonight. Um, he put it off. He put it off. He had family at his house. He goes, he has dinner with his family. He goes to bed. He cannot stop, stop thinking about Jethro. He gets out, he drives, he, he gets out. He says at one o'clock in the morning, he starts driving around <laughs> looking for him. He said, man, I cannot get him out of my mind. He said, I can't find him. He says, I go back to my house. He can't sleep. I'm praying, Lord, forgive me for not talking to him. He gets up the next morning, and he goes back to this grocery store where Jethro was or close to the night before. And he's like, hey, do you know where he's at? I, I, do you know where he lives at? And the person thinks that, you know what, he died last night. And he said he never, ever, he said he never drives by there with not having a broken heart because he did not take the opportunity and feel the nudging of the Holy Spirit in his life to go share his faith. And he says from that day forward, when I see somebody, I instantaneously think God loves them. They have a soul, and I have a reason to talk to them about their eternal destination. The thing that should break our hearts the most, and I, there's a lot of things that break our hearts. But the thing that should break our hearts the most is when somebody leaves this world and doesn't know Jesus Christ. There's nothing more hopeless. Now, for lack of a better word, we don't think that way. Amen? I mean, we don't ever think that way. By and large, when I go to funerals, I've never been to a funeral where they have this, I mean, we, a lot of times we know it from a spiritual sense. You know what I'm saying? And, and you think to yourself, listen, in life, some funerals are very easy to preach because the people have openly declared Jesus as their Savior. You, you've seen the fruits of, the, of their work. You've seen God bless them. Other words, you just didn't know. You know what I mean? There wasn't, and God's a fair judge. God is the only person who's the judge. I'm not, you're not, right? I don't know anybody's heart no more than you do. But we know fruit, right? You understand what I'm saying? But there are others who have just openly declared they don't want nothing to do with God. And that you can vouch for. And so when, when, when you think to yourself, do I have a reason to evangelize on a personal level? Absolutely. You absolutely do. And as we're going through this, understand, we've become a lot of society cold-hearted. When you see somebody die, you can break their heart for their family, but you ask yourself the question, I wonder if they knew the Lord. 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 Let that burden become your burden. Amen? So, let's get going. Number one, what are things that hinder us from... Personally evangelizing. Number one, ignorance of the fact that it is our duty. All right? So from henceforward, let everybody in this room be aware it is your job to share your faith in Jesus Christ and have spiritual discussions with people and lead them to the Lord. Amen? All right? Um, it's not an optional thing. It's a matter of duty to all, all, emphasize all Christians. And I've used these verses over and over again. 
so I didn't even put them up here. Matthew 28, 18, and 20. Go you therefore make disciples, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 2 Timothy 2, 2. Faithful men are to teach others. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Um, get off the meat, off the milk and onto the meat. By this time you ought to be what? You ought to be teachers. Um, Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. The master dealt with the servants individually, not as a group. What did you do with what, with what God gave you? Did you hide it? Did you go and, and grow it? Um, tell me what you did. And I don't want to stand before the Lord one day and Jesus says, Hey, how many people did you share your faith with? Well, that wasn't my job. That's not going to be a good answer for us. We all need to share our faith. So a lot of times it's ignorance. It's not my job. Yes, it is. Number two. No interest in the lost. Luke 19.10, I've used that verse over and over again. Jesus said his reason to come here on this earth was to seek and to save that which was lost. Um, the lost should be the primary focus of the Christian. If our great commission is to go share our faith, then who should we be looking for? Lost, right? So everywhere you get, lost. Every morning, Lord, help me to find somebody today. Give me an opportunity to share my faith. Um, and when you look around and start looking for lost people, it ain't hard to find. They're everywhere. That's why Jesus said the, the harvest is what? Great. It's huge. But the laborers, they're few. Um, Romans um, 9, 1 through 3. Or, uh, okay, that's, supposed to, that's actually Romans, not Luke. With Christ as my witness, this is Paul. He said, I speak with the utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Wow. That's huge. Paul said, I would rather, I would die and go to hell. That they might be saved. That's how great his, that, that's how great his burden was for, the, for his brothers. Could you imagine? Uh, uh, do we have that kind of burden for people? But yet we should. Whatever it takes. Romans 10, 1 through 3. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is a misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. He's worried. He, he says, I know they, they love God and they have a zeal for God, but they don't understand. He even starts looking at their behaviors. Listen, if he says to them that they're trying to get there by works. Do works get us there? No, but Jesus. So we see there's an ignorance. There's a lack of uh, lack of. Uh, interest in the lost um, there's next there's an improper attitude um, toward the lost um, there, you ever heard that old song were it not for grace were it not for grace nobody okay I'll have Stephanie sing it okay <laughs> I'll stop there alright were it not for the grace of God Every one of us would be in the boat. Amen? Listen, if you ever get the attitude that you're better than somebody else because you got saved, you need to look at your salvation. You understand me? Because, listen, if it wasn't by the grace of God, I'd be an alcoholic dead in a creek right now. Period. There's no telling what would happen to any of our lives if it wasn't for Jesus. Jesus and Him alone. He, and when we understand, listen... A lot of Christians have the attitude, well, we don't get around those people. You'll never reach those people until they become your people. Amen? You can't help those people if they're not your people. Amen? So, Luke 8, 9 through 12. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like the other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and give you a tenth of my income. I didn't put up the last two verses, but do you know what the tax collector prayed? Please forgive me. I'm a merciful, I'm a merciful, give me mercy, I'm a horrible sinner. 
which one do you think had the better attitude? The tax collector did. And I'll tell you that as Christians, we've got to understand, if it weren't for God's grace, amen, we would be in the exact same boat. Um, and so, until every person you see, if they're, it doesn't matter their color, don't matter their job, don't matter what they look like, no matter how they're dressed, they are creation of God. And if it weren't by the grace of God, we'd all be in the exact same boat. Amen? Um, remember Luke, in Luke chapter 15, I didn't put this up. Do you remember the um, attitude of the older brother? Do you remember? He's like, Dad, I've done everything I was supposed to do. Why didn't you kill a fatted calf for me? Um, well, and finally, the father looks at me, son, everything I have is yours. Always has been. You should rejoice. Um, we should rejoice. Um, we don't want to be like Jonah and be like mad that the Ninevites repented, right? We don't want to have that attitude. Um, some are waiting for the church to uh, organize program. I'm organizing a program for you. <laughs> Go lead somebody to the Lord. That's your program. Amen? Um, every local church needs to be greatly concerned with the task of reaching the lost. As individuals, though, we have the responsibility to seek out and teach lost souls whether or not the church ever organizes a program. Now I want to stop and pause here for a second because God's kind of worked me over through the years. Um, and I don't like to, I, I, I'm, trust me, I'm not, I'm not trying to speak against other churches or anything like that. Um, salvation, um, we've, we've made it in our society, we've made it way too easy to, to be saved. Amen? Um, salvation is more than, it's more than uttering a prayer. That's the start of your walk with God, but that's not, it's more than, the preacher leading you on a Sunday morning saying, hey, lift your hand if you said this prayer, right? It's more than filling out a card and saying, hey, I got saved today. Um, now if you go to mega churches, you'll see a number on the board and they'll say, hey, text this if you said this prayer today. It's more than that. That's cheap grace. Now, is accepting Christ an easy process? Yes, it's for everybody. But I will tell you that it's more than this, this, and this. Um, in fact, Nick... You're the last person that I helped lead to the Lord right here. And if I, I looked at Nick that morning, and I said, Nick, this is the beginning of it. I said, the proof will be in the pudding. Because I prayed the sinner's prayer with a lot of people right here at this altar. And I'm going to tell you, their life's never even changed one bit. Ever. And so people say, well, I, I, can, I believe in God. So does the devil. Right? So belief has, requires actions. And I've learned to say, Nick, I think I said to you, the proof will be in the pudding. And the, the truth is, you're going to let Jesus do a work in your life or you're not. Um, but that's cheap grace. And there's a lot of people who are selling cheap grace today. Um, and that, I'm telling you, that dog doesn't hunt. All right? It just doesn't hunt. Um, there, there's something that comes with that. Amen? Um, now, I don't want to enlighten because the Bible does say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's by your mouth that you confess or save, your heart that you believe in or justify. Anybody, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But calling on the name of the Lord is more than just... That's not calling on the name of the Lord. That's raising your hand. All right? When I was a kid, when I, I remember I went to school, uh, uh, ah, with the church in Dallas. Um, we had a fairly large church down there where we, where we went. And the preacher, then, if you wanted to be saved, um, you, every head bowed and eyes closed, he just wants you to look at him. Make eye contact. Now, then after a while, I can remember, seriously, um, it, we didn't want anybody feeling uncomfortable, right? You didn't want anybody feeling, listen, when I felt uncomfortable, I got saved. And I was glad. The, 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 the discomfort went away. It's something that... Listen, is it an uncomfortable moment? Yes, because my sin makes me uncomfortable, right? And so anyway, I just, I don't want to get off on a ton tangent there. But um, as individuals, though, we have the responsibility to seek out and teach lost souls whether or not the church ever organizes a program. Um, we spend all of our time talking about it. Personal evangelism needs to be considered, discussed among the brethren. I think what we're doing here on Wednesday night is good. But if all we did is teach personal evangelism for the next 10 years and we never actually went out and personally evangelized, we're bad. Okay? Um, sometimes you can talk things to death. Amen? 
Um, that's why when I do projects with Dave, when we first started building things, Dave said, Andy, we have talked long enough. Remember saying that, Dave? Okay. Talking will not accomplish anything. Um, so, first thing is lack of effort. Um, secondly, inadequacies in our effort. Um, we're overly cautious. We're afraid of offending. You ever been afraid of offending? Come on, raise your hand. I know you have, right? I've been afraid. I don't want to offend them, right? <laughs> Amen. I've been there. I, I have argued with the devil. I'm telling you, I've argued with the devil over offending people. And in the last probably year and a half, God gave me this word, and I'm sticking with it. A harsh truth is always better than a false reality. False hopes send people to hell. Harsh truths lead people to the Lord. Amen? Um, I don't know. I'm certainly glad that my grandpa Kenneth and my uncle Kevin weren't worried about offending me. Amen? Nick, you glad I wasn't worried about offending you on that Sunday morning? When, are you glad that I wasn't worried about offending you on that Sunday morning? I mean, well, you wouldn't be here tonight if I was worried about offending you. Um, now listen, when I say this, I'm not asking you to go just tick somebody off, all right? Do you understand what I'm saying? But and here's a lot of the reasons why we get offensive with people. Because a lot of times we, we determine salvation based on their behaviors. So if somebody's drinking, we want to say, okay, you shouldn't get drunk. Or we want to talk about drunkenness. Or if some, we use the word homosexuality, we want to start with that sin. Listen, I, I sin. So do you. If, you. if you start trying to fix people's behavior, you're going to offend them. If you start trying to lead them to Jesus and let Jesus fix their behavior, you're going to win them. You see the difference? And so a lot of times we get so concentrated on, you know, something that somebody's for or against. But when we start introducing Christ to them and telling them what Christ did and what Christ said and what Christ has done in our life, and then you let them fall in love with Jesus, all right? Now, it's a process, God will begin to change their behavior, I'm telling you. He'll begin to work on their hearts, work on the things they do. He'll convict them the way that he convicts them. Do you, do, things now, do you not do things now that you used to do years ago when you were a baby Christian? Amen. There's things that God's convicted me over and changed me over. How many language changed since you, since you started walking with Christ? Amen. The things you watch has changed. Amen. I mean, the things you read, the things you learn, it changes over time. Why? Because God convicts you about them and you grow in your faith. A lot of times we're expecting instant change, right? Were we instantly changed? No, no. I, I, I forgot Dave. I think it was Dave who was telling me this. And Dave probably said, Andy, that never happened. But he said somebody got saved on the construction side or came back and he was like, Dave, I've never felt this blankety blank good in my life. You know what I mean? Was that you? Oh, I'm sure you're going to say no. Anyway. <laughs> but it's amazing how salvation, you know what I mean? It takes time, right? Did you know not to cuss? Nah. Be part of your vernacular. You got used to it. And so anyway, um, we cannot be afraid to offend anybody. Um, the ad this attitude causes one to soften and compromise the message of the gospel. It, it, it becomes a works-based message and not a, and not a Jesus-based message. Jesus, his very name, offends people. It does. Wherever you're at, I'm telling you what, you say the name Jesus, you are going to get a response. People are going to go, Woo, Jesus! Or they're going to be like, oh, they'll curse it, they'll use his name, they'll frown, they'll, whatever. Jesus draws a response. Um, be, being overly anxious, we get nervous. How many of you get nervous? Oh, I've been there, done that, get so nervous, going to talk about spiritual things. Woo! Listen. Amen? Now, I've learned that there are certain conversations that people naturally avoid. Spiritual conversations, political conversations, all right? Unless they know the politics of the other person, right? Um, people t tend to, they don't want to talk about relationships too much, Right? Um, we know certain conversations that people tend to avoid, right? 
Now, we avoid them because we don't know how to handle them. But Caleb and Stephanie and Jack, they say I have the, I ask a lot of questions. Um, I don't know if it's a gift that God gave me. I don't know what it is, but I can sit and talk to you. And Caleb says I make things awkward, all right? Um, Krista, I remember the first time she came over to our house and I started asking her questions. And Caleb's like, Dad, shut up. You're making it awkward. You know what I mean? And I'm just trying to find... The best way I can learn about you is start asking you questions. I'm at the drive through window at McDonald's a while back, and Steph, I'm, starting, I'm, trying, I'm talking to the drive through person. And Stephanie finally, she's like, stop it. They don't care why you ordered this food. They don't care what your tradition is on Thanksgiving. They just want your money. I said, fine. I said, okay. Let's not have a relationship. But you know what? I know every girl at McDonald's name and guy... And I call them by name, and when I go up there, they're like, hey, Andy, how are you today? You want your usual? You think I have a better chance of reaching them than Stephanie? <laughs> she don't even know their name. I gave Monique a Christmas card. You know what I mean? I mean, so, listen, my point is, is make it, make it, listen, ask the questions, make it, don't be nervous. What is the worst somebody can say to you? Hey, I'd really not like to talk about it. Okay. And if they don't want to talk about it, okay. What would you say, Jacob? What else could they say? Like cuss at you? Jacob, that's okay. People cuss at me all the time. I mean, listen. Hey, as a Christian, you, get, you're gonna, you need, everybody needs to get used. You're going to get cussed at every now and then. Just brace yourself. Jesus was killed. We can handle the curse words, I promise you. Um, if you go to the abortion clinic ever with us, you're going to see a lot of middle fingers. All right? I mean, a lot of them. Frank, one day, he was sitting there and he was holding his sign on a stool. All right? And I was standing, this guy pulled up in him. He's like, he just starts cursing Frank. You mother effer, you don't know what the eff you're doing out here, blah, blah, blah. Well, Frank can't hear what he's saying. <laughs> and he's just smiling at him. Have a good day, you know? <laughs> Listen, every now and then, you're going to get cursed at. It's just part of it, all right? Remember what Jesus said. They hated me first, all right? So, it's go hey, whatever anxiousness you have, just remind yourself. Listen, everybody's got it. You need 12 seconds. That's all you need, 12 seconds. 12 seconds of courage. Get it out there, and you'll get it back. We got to move. We're way behind. That's okay. Um, when I get nervous too, my heart starts pounding. Does yours do that? And you're like, man, I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you know what I, else? I just don't want to harp on this, but I've learned this as, 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 from pastoring. You know, we, we like to put off difficult conversations. The longer you put off a difficult conversation, the worse it's going to be in your head. As soon as you need to have a conversation, as soon as you get the nudge, go have the conversation. You'll sleep better. Air will be, be able to breathe better. Food will taste better. All right? People, we stress ourselves out over conversations, and we make things happen in our head, and normally they don't ever happen. Amen? Now, I know what you're like, because a lot of, most of you are like me. There's a few of you that aren't. Most of you are like me, and you worry about what the other people might think. I know there's some of you in here be like, I'll say anything you want me to say, Andy. Anyway, okay. They use the wrong appeals. Friendliness of the congregation, the building's air conditioning, beauty, comfort are typical of the improper appeals used to attract the interest and attention of others. There is but one valid appeal. You cannot go to heaven if you do not obey the gospel. Amen? Um, I, I love a church. I love how pretty it is. Listen, nobody has ever been giving their life over to Christ because they sat on a beautiful pew. Didn't happen. Um, we have ungodliness in our own lives. To be a positive influence for good, you must live a godly life. Um, if you're not living a godly life, then more than likely you're not going to be convicted to share your faith because you're going to be like, I'm a hypocrite. You ever felt that way? Who am I to share my faith? I'm as guilty as all these things. Um, all of us are sinful, but it's the difference in having the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ over our lives or not. Um, consider Romans 2.21. I don't even have it up here. Oh, it's on the paper. You therefore, 
who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? And so all of us, we should seek to honor God in everything that we do. And where we fall short, seek forgiveness. A lack of conversion. Too many Christians, no matter what they profess, are still living for themselves. Now this will hit home, may or may not, may stomp on your feet. They have failed to deny self. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. And be transformed into living sacrifices. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, my brethren, we give our bodies as a living sacrifice. Be ye transformed, not conformed. Um, we have to give ourselves over to Christ. Um, if we are living ungodly lives, you're probably not going to be able to win anybody. Um, people say, well, I, what I do is I'll go get drunk at a bar. That way I might win people. Stop it. No. Um, too many Christians are doing what they do for themselves. Um, they do not view themselves as servants. Romans 16, 6, 7, and 18 says, Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey, obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Um, we are um, People say, well, um, we live in the land of the free, home of the brave. Amen? But I'm going to tell you, as Christians, we're not free to do everything. Period. We're not free. We're slaves to Christ. And that's what I want to be. I want to be a servant of Christ. I want to follow His way, obey His commands. Amen? Improper, improper tac tactics. Proper tactics. Um, bluntness or harshness. Some seem to, to delight in telling people they are going to hell. I have never in my life seen somebody say, I hear somebody say, hey, you're going to hell. See the person, okay, tell me how to get out of it. Have you? That just doesn't work. Um, Ephesians 4.15. Instead, we will speak truth and love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body of the church. You're going to share somebody with the Lord. Make sure they realize that you have a genuine care for their heart and their soul. Listen, I'd much when somebody when I, I see how somebody loves me, I'm telling you, and, I, and I, even in return, if I've shown myself to love somebody in a genuine love, They've been willing to listen. People can see your heart pretty easy. They see it through your actions, through your words, through your tone. Um, approaching a person at an in inappropriate time. Um, cornering someone in an embarrassing situation in the vestibule or in front of families or friends. Um, consider the barber who raised his razor and asked his customer, are you ready to die? <laughs> um, Amen. <laughs> Put like Caleb as the driver. You know what I mean? Do you know the Lord? Right? Um, or, you know, like Chris in a sonic stall. You know what I mean? I, 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 listen, there's improper ways to do things, okay? Um, consider, consider how the other person feels at that moment. Does that make sense? Take in consideration the feelings. And as opposed to cornering them saying the vestibule or... You know, if I'm preaching a sermon and it's on salvation, you're sitting there going, hey, he's talking to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's going to make it unusually awkward, right? I wouldn't want to sit like that. Um, however, you could go to him and say, hey, would you like to discuss, you wanted to meet and discuss this sermon later on and just see how it applies to each of our lives? You think that would sound good? Right? And so you're able to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting and you can personally evangelize um, speak the truth in love be gentle an apostle of Christ as apostles of Christ we certainly had a right to make some demands of you but instead we were like children among you or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own be gentle with people um, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves Matthew 10 36 your enemies will be right in your own household first Peter 3 15 
answer others with meekness and fear. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to give a defense. Um, Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be with grace and seasoned with salt. Let your conversations be so gracious and, gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. If people get offended, let it be because of the truth, not because of our efforts or our words. Deficiency in our knowledge of the Bible. Did you ever have a salesman try to sell you a product about which he knew absolutely nothing? Were they a good salesman? No. Um, God's worker is to study so that he or she might properly use the word of truth. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15, work hard so we can present ourselves to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. And so um, you may not be a, a Bible genius, you don't have to be, but you certainly should be studying to show yourself approved of the word you're trying to share. Amen? Um, conclusion. And we'll be done. Daniel Webster says this. If we work upon marble, it will perish. If we work upon brass, time will efface it. If we rear temples, they will crumble into dust. But if we work upon the immortal minds, if we imbue them with principles, with the just fear of God and love of our fellow man, we engrave on those tablets something that will brighten to all eternity. Um, when you work on the soul of man, it won't, it won't fade away as moth and rust destroy Amen? Amen. Good word tonight? All right. Food bank, 9 o'clock in the morning. Dave, you coming? I was talking to Dave Officer, Dave. All right. Okay. you be here. Amy, you got work tomorrow? You coming? Okay. All right. Frank, you coming? Okay. All right. Lewis? If what? what? What would be the if? Thunder and lightning. We'll go in the building. I mean, hey, we got to have faith. You know what I mean? Heavenly Father, thank you for our time here tonight. God bless us, lead us, guide us, direct us. Lord, help us to share our faith. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. Y'all be careful going home. Love y'all.